we are fast approaching the tribulation or 70th week of Daniel. The final seven years of history before Jesus returns to rule and reign on the earth. Now some think we're already in those years right now. But if it's true that we're approaching that time, then all Christians need to know how to recognize the sign that we have been given that begins this period of time. Very few things are more important. So that's what we're talking about today. And we're starting right now. Yet despite the importance of this sign, the sign that the 70th week has begun, there is a tremendous amount of controversy about it. Some say it's the rapture of the church. Some say it's a peace treaty or a covenant between the Antichrist and Israel. Some say it's the revealing of the Antichrist and others say it is the beginning of twice daily sacrifices on the Temple Mount. And others still say there is no sign. And there are even more theories than that. So you get the idea. There are at least a half dozen theories about what launches the 70th week of Daniel. And all these theories have some basis in scripture. So today we're going to examine each of these theories one by one and see what the Bible says about them. Probably the most well-known theory is that the 70th week of Daniel begins with a peace treaty made by the Antichrist and Israel. I bet 90% of you watching this video right now think that is the sign. This theory is based on a single verse from the book of Daniel, and he shall make a strong covenant with the many for one week. This verse comes from Daniel's famous 70 weeks prophecy, and it certainly says that during the 70th week of Daniel, someone makes a strong covenant or strengthens an existing covenant for all seven years of that period. So this is definitely a sign of the beginning of the 70th week. If we see such a sign happening, that is. So let's look at this in more depth. First, let's investigate who the mysterious he is in this passage to see if it's truly the Antichrist. Pronouns like he, she, it can never just appear in a passage. They always refer back to a person mentioned earlier in the text. This previously mentioned person is called the antecedent by English scholars, and it is almost always the last person mentioned in the text. In this case, the previous person listed in Daniel 9 is someone known as the prince who is to come. Ha, there it is, say most watching this video, proof that the Antichrist is the he. Here is the verse about that person. Let's look at it. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. I am sure most of you are thinking it's the people of the coming Antichrist who destroyed the temple in AD 70. So that settles it. Well, not quite. When one is interpreting scripture, context means everything. And the two words, prince and covenant found in these passages are also found previously in the context of Daniel chapter nine. Did you know that? The word covenant is the Hebrew word berit, and it is found seven times in the book of Daniel and twice in chapter nine alone. Every other time, it means the holy covenant between God and man. Let's look at the earlier reference back in chapter 9. Daniel was praying. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. This use of covenant is obviously not about a treaty between an evil ruler and Israel. Rather, it's the holy covenant between God and his people. So Daniel was specifically praying about the covenant. Did Gabriel decide to pull a fast one on Daniel and insert a different meaning for covenant when he answered Daniel's prayer? I sincerely doubt it, and so should you. Second, let's look at the word prince. The word is also found earlier in Daniel 9. In fact, it is found only one verse earlier than the prince who is to come reference. 
So you are to know and understand that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So only one verse earlier, this Hebrew word, Nagid, which we translate as Prince, referred to the Messiah himself. This should cause you to stop and think. In verse 25, we have one character, Messiah the Prince. Then in verse 26, we seem to have two characters with this same group of names. A Messiah who is cut off and killed and a Prince who is to come later. But are they two characters, really? Or just the same Messiah the Prince that was just mentioned with two comings? We as Christians should know the answer. Jesus is the one, but has two comings. One to die for our sins as the Messiah, and one to come again and rule and reign as the Prince who is to come. So the Prince who is to come is Jesus. He is the one who strengthens a covenant. The Holy Covenant for seven years, and only seven years. So that doesn't mean that this happened back in the first century. This is future. And he is the one who commands the Antichrist to end the twice daily sacrifice in the 70th week as well. And surprisingly, he is also the one who commanded the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple back in 8070. And this is what throws most Christians off. They're looking for an evil person to have done this. But you see, Jesus prophesied he would command the destruction of Jerusalem in the parable of the wedding feast that he told during Holy Week, you know, the last week of his ministry. Now the king was angry and he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city, and by that he meant Jerusalem, on fire. So it is the king, King Jesus, who sent the armies to burn Jerusalem. Those armies are the people of the prince who is to come. They're not Romans, they're not Syrians, they're not Jews, but everyone who is responsible for Jerusalem's destruction. They are the people of the prince who is to come. So it's Jesus who strengthens the Holy Covenant for seven years, the seven year tribulation. This would of course be the new covenant because that's the covenant we are under right now. How does he do this? Christians are already saved. They can't be any more saved, but they can be infilled with the Holy Spirit in an Acts 2 kind of way. In Joel 2.28, we learn that before the sixth seal, God says this, I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. So is this what Daniel 9.27 is talking about? This same strengthening of a new covenant resulting in an infilling of the Holy Spirit, which is mentioned in Joel 2.28 in an end time context? Well, I think so. I think that's exactly what Daniel 9.27 is about. And in Matthew 10, we learn that in the end times, the Holy Spirit will grant the following powers to some believers. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse those with leprosy, cast out demons. This passage in Matthew 10 is about both the sending out of disciples two by two in the first century and also has an end time meaning. It is a dual fulfillment passage. So this would definitely be a way the covenant is strengthened. Why would Jesus do something like this? Well, possibly because if Satan and his demons are being cast to the earth, during that time, Christians will need the infilling of the Spirit to combat them and the deception that is all around. But you might be saying, hey, 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 wait a minute. My pastor and my favorite prophecy teachers, not you, all say it is the Antichrist who make a covenant. How can you be so sure it's Jesus? Well, we have a simple solution for you. Rewind the video right now and watch this section a second time. 
look at the biblical exegesis logically. And we're sure you're going to agree it can't be the Antichrist. In terms of your other teachers, tradition is a strong force in prophecy. It is difficult to overcome what everyone else is saying and very easy to just assume that your favorite prophecy teachers and mine had gotten it right back in the past. And part of the reason for this is a false peace is linked to the end times. In Isaiah 28, we learn about a treaty with death that is made by the Jewish people. And in Jeremiah, we learn how false prophets will proclaim peace when there is no peace. But these aren't what Daniel 9.27 is speaking of. They aren't the sign. They could happen sooner than the 70th week or maybe during it. But they aren't the sign of its beginning. So we found one sure sign of a 70th week beginning. Jesus pouring out the Holy Spirit on believers. But will we see this? Will we be able to know this has happened for sure? Most probably won't be able to tell with certainty. So let's keep looking at other proposed signs. The second most popular sign that the 70th week has begun is that the rapture happens at that point in time. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this when the disciples specifically asked him for the signs of his coming. Did Jesus mention a rapture then? Here's what he said. And Jesus answered and said to them, See to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will mislead many people. And you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for those things must take place. But that is not yet the end, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will hand you over to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Jesus gives us a whole list of things that happened before the Great Tribulation and the midpoint of the 70th week, but he doesn't mention a rapture. If you are a person who thinks that's when it happens, don't you find that a bit odd? He didn't mention a peace treaty with the Antichrist either. That is just one more reason to know that an Antichrist peace treaty is not something we should look for, and frankly, neither is the rapture. When Jesus was asked point blank about the signs to look for, either he misled the disciples or a rapture of millions of people is not happening prior to his return in Matthew 24, 30. Now, we could argue that point until Jesus returns. Thousands of books have been written on this subject from both sides, after all. But, you know, the simple thought that Jesus didn't mention either a rapture or a peace treaty when asked specifically for signs should tell us neither is something we should be looking for. What about the list that Jesus did give us in Matthew 24? Maybe one of those is the sign of the 70th week. Well, Jesus never tied these things to the 70th week of Daniel. Later, he did tie the abomination of desolation to the book of Daniel and directed us to read it. But he didn't tie the beginning of birth pangs as he obviously could have. So maybe they are signs of the beginning of the 70th week and maybe they aren't. The same goes for the first seal of Revelation and the coming of the white horse rider. Many think this rider is the sign of the beginning of the 70th week and again, maybe he is. But we don't know exactly when these seals open. Some think the first couple of seals have already opened. My guess is that they begin to open during the 70th week, but you know, we can't be 100% sure. Many think the white horse rider is the Antichrist and that he's revealed at the beginning of the 70th week. Although there are many things we can't know, as we said, we can know that idea is inaccurate. The reason is that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, we are told the Antichrist, or man of lawlessness, is revealed at the midpoint of a 70th week. 
at the abomination of desolation. No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. That's when he's revealed. And I can hear someone in the audience saying, hey, hey, wait a minute. The Antichrist is revealed when he signs that peace treaty. Oh, wait a minute. That's what they're probably saying. <laughs> they're probably saying, I forgot what I just learned, that there is no Antichrist signing a peace treaty as a sign. That's right. The Antichrist is revealed at the midpoint. Others have suggested that the blasphemous twice daily sacrifices are resumed at the beginning of the 70th week. Well, we know these sacrifices are ended at the midpoint, at the abomination of desolation, so they have to begin somewhere between now, because they haven't started yet, and then. But we aren't directly told when they begin. Some, including myself, believe Daniel 8.14 tells us when they begin, about a half a year after the beginning of the 70th week. But this is an assumption based only on one way of interpreting the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel 8. But either way, there isn't a single prophecy saying the 70th week begins with these sacrifices either. So we have a number of signs to look for, the pouring out and infilling of the Holy Spirit in a miraculous way, and potentially some others. The coming of false prophets and messiahs, the beginning of sacrifices, is maybe even a peace treaty. But only the infilling of the Holy Spirit is 100% linked to the 70th week. And another question we should ask at this point is, can the 70th week of Daniel begin on any old day of the year? Or must it begin on a certain day? This would be important to know. And you know what? This isn't well understood either. The 70th week of Daniel is a grouping of seven Hebraic years called Shabuim in the Hebrew of Daniel 9. These are very specific Hebrew years and begin on the first day of a Hebrew year. They're a sabbatical cycle. Now the problem is that there are two Hebrew years, the secular year that starts on Rosh Hashanah and the religious year that starts on Nisan 1. So which one is it? Sabbatical cycles use the secular year. So we can know with 100% assurance that the 70th week begins like all other Shabuim on Rosh Hashanah. Now I know that it's popular in prophetic circles to use day counts like 2,550 days to create a supposed 70th week, but that takes the seven year period out of context. It's a sabbatical cycle and they all start on Rosh Hashanah or Tishri 1 with the sighting of a new moon. In fact, one of these seven year sabbatical cycles is scheduled to begin this year on 2021, according to the Jewish calendar. Now, we find that very interesting. We don't always agree with the Jewish calendar. And this saying a sabbatical cycle is happening this year might not be correct. But maybe this is the year. Maybe the 70th week will begin this year. Now, Hebrew religious years figure into this 70th week also, however. They are what the Bible calls times or appointed times, a group of the feasts of the Lord. And it's the same usage in time, times, and half a time. Click right here to keep watching and see how these two years, the seven secular years and the three and a half religious years are organized in the 70th week and how the various events of the 70th week line up with these two years. I think your eyes will be opened to what Revelation has to say about the end times when you see this analysis of the years. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.